My name's Paul Bestall. This is Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Welcome to episode 41 of Mysteries and Monsters. This week, we're staying in Australia, as I am joined by Australian Fortean researcher, Steve Crawford. Steve has embraced his love of the weird that struck him as a young man in Belfast, and has continued to embrace it even more once he emigrated to Australia. We cover Steve's love of the weird, his thoughts on the possible survival of both the thylacine and the Japanese wolf, his yaoi research, hominids around the world, poltergeists, and we also touch on the infamous Westall UFO experience, as well as a whole lot more. Once again, we just want to say thank you again for the kind words we receive across all our social media platforms in recent weeks. It really does mean a lot to know how much people enjoy the show, so thank you. Uh, It makes it all worthwhile. Make sure you leave us a nice review on your podcast app, because that's the way the show's continuing to grow. So thank you, and we hope you can do that for us. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter, as well as joining the two pages on Facebook as well. You can also help us on Patreon for $1 a month. Just to give you a heads up, we will be releasing episodes over the Christmas and New Year period, so I hope you enjoy what we've got lined up for our end-of-year show, and maybe I'll give you all a very special Christmas edition as well. We've also just finalising the 50th episode, which blows my mind to think I'm going to hit 50 episodes. So thank you um, if you've been there since the beginning. And uh, I can't believe we're almost a year old. Um, So all being well, I think we'll have a cracking guest or two on episode 50. And I hope it's a show you don't want to miss. Right. Enough of me waffling on. It's time for this week's interview with Steve Crawford. My guest today is Steve Crawford, a member of the Australian Rare Fauna Society, host of Weird Planet on Facebook, and a member of the Victorian Yari Research Group. Steve, delighted to welcome to you. How are you, sir? Good, sir. How are you? We're very well for a Saturday here, my friend. Yeah, so, thanks for having us. Hey, you're very welcome. Thank you for wanting to join me. Um, first of all, yeah. How long have you been out in Oz? Because uh, I'm, I'm sure many people will already spot that uh, you don't have a, the typical Australian twang, Steve. No, this is a very proud Belfast accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been here since since 2004. Wow. We were um, backpacking, decided to get away from all the nonsense back home. and yeah. The search for a bit of, uh, yeah, something a bit different. Yeah. And ended up uh, meeting my wife. And we got married in 2006 and been here ever since yeah. in Melbourne. Fantastic. Was it? Was, I mean, I've, yeah. I've I've spoken to a couple of, of of expats. I've got a couple of really good friends who've who've emigrated out to Australia, and it, they tell a similar story of they went there on holiday or, or backpacking and just fell in love with the place. Was that what happened to you? And you just yeah. kind of yeah. fortunately met the the love of your life and took it from there, my friend. Yes, yeah, that's true. But um, oh, it's if you haven't been to Australia, I recommend that anybody uh, gets a chance to make sure they go. It's um, an absolutely wonderful place, and yeah. it's really vast. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's one of the things. And I, I, when I've spoken to a couple of other people, like uh, Yowie Dan, and, and uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to speak to Gary Opit the other week, I think a lot of yeah. people don't realise just how big Australia is who, who don't live yeah. there. Yeah. Well, last um, oh, two years ago, I drove from Melbourne up to Queen, um, Brisbane. Yeah. 
Yeah. That took us three days. Now we had a few <laughs> stops. We went through the west, um, western New South Wales. And when you get to places like that, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, you get an appreciation of the expanse of land that they have. I mean, there's just just uh, as far as the you could possibly see was just fields mm. where farmers were growing and they had haystacks. Yeah. But it's, it's just it was mind boggling. It really was mind boggling. So how did you have this an interest in in Fortean subjects and the and the paranormal, Steve? Before you moved out to Australia. Oh yeah, um, yeah. When I was a kid, yeah, definitely. Um, my parents actually, my parents are still alive, and uh, whenever it's my birthday, they still send over a copy of Fortean Times. <laughs> <Fantastic>. <laughs> even though even though I get it here regularly anyway, but yeah, from an early age, I was always interested in that type of thing. More from, uh, I think it more comes from my mum's side. Yeah. Where um, she was very, um, I'm not sure if you have it in England, but it's uh, Pentecostal churches. Yes, yes, we where do. Where the people sometimes speak in tongues and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, yeah. And she was a member of that from an early age, and she was very aware of spirits and that kind of thing. And look, I'm on the fence about a lot of that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but it was always made known to me that... Um, at least one of my parents was uh, very open to that type of scenario, mm. those type of things, that type of phenomena. Yeah. And yeah, a few odd bits and pieces happened to me when I was a kid growing up as well. Yeah. And then yeah, the interest was always there from a very early age. Mm. Mm. So you've you've kind of developed obviously and embraced uh, an interest in in the Australian cryptozoology because obviously the two most famous um, Australian uh, mystery creatures, I think, for anybody outside of the, the continent, are, are mm-hmm. obviously the thylacine and the yowie. Yeah. So, yeah. that's, I mean, I, I've got a very similar kind of interest in, in how my interest developed in it, Steve, because that, you know, that it was my mother's side uh, who were very in touch with spiritualism and things like that, and, and my kind of love mm. of, of weird developed from... Uh, yeah. What what most yeah. people would say, living in a weird house. Uh, <laughs> so it was. Well, it's it's funny you say that because my parents are still living in a haunted house now. <laughs> <laughs> what in Bel? Are they, do they still live in Belfast? Yeah, they're oh. still alive and um, occasionally have unusual occurrences happening in their house. I'll say. <laughs> the feathers come out of nowhere. They can smell cigarette smoke. Neither of them smoke. All this kind of thing. But they find it, it's kind of interesting for the, the different generations because they find that kind of thing comforting, mm. which um, I think is actually quite sweet. Yeah, it is. You know, really... for them, they have the sort of comfort as well. Yeah, I know we had a couple of, um, we had, my auntie passed away um, quite young. And, uh, oh, sorry. For, uh, yeah, it's, unfortunately, it happens, um, we're not the only family that's, that's suffered uh, such a such a sad yeah. event. But yeah. um, it's... Um, they had a couple of, I mean, I never had anything um, occur after she'd passed away, but my mother did and my uncle both had yeah. um, experiences. My mum's was very comforting. My my uncle's was very uh, distressing for him. So it was quite interesting that it, it developed in, in, in a different way for, for both of them, despite the fact that they both had a very close um positive relationship with my auntie it was it was interesting that they had very different reactions post her her tragic passing so it's we've we've always been very open minded um regardless and like you say i think a lot of uh, the older generation sort of the post war generation are very seem to find comfort in in visitations i think yeah yeah also maybe a part well theorizing just out loud that maybe the spirit knew that it needed to make itself known in a certain way to certain people as well. Maybe your uncle needed to be shocked. Maybe your auntie needed to be comforted. Well, this just is... to let them know that they're still there and you're like passed on. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's... It's just, pretty... an, just a theory, just a yeah, theory. No, I think that's a, that's a, that's a justified uh, point of view, I think, Steve, because uh, my uncle is a very sceptical man. Yeah, so, so maybe, maybe he did, yeah, maybe he did need his foundations rocking a little. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be all from time to time. Oh, very much so. <laughs> so yeah, so how did you kind of get involved in the in 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 thylacines and and yowies then, Steve? Was it just through conversation, or did you kind of gravitate towards those areas? Oh, well, whenever I got my I got my, <clears throat> sorry, me. Sorry, I got something that's stuck in my throat. Yeah. 
after I got married and we had kids, um, we were watching. It's called Foxtel here, but it's Sky in the UK, the oh. satellite TV channel. And by chance, I would lost sort of touch with all fourteen uh, times and stuff for about five or six years. I was flicking through and I came across Animal Planet, and I seen um, <laughs> of all things Finding Bigfoot. Yeah. And uh, I never knew anything about it and started watching that and thinking, how on earth are they going to, like, you know, if this is a, a physical animal, they're making so much noise <laughs> that how on earth do they expect to actually come across anything? <laughs> you know what I mean? If you go into the bush with cameras and, you know, there's nothing that's scary to any animal in the bush is the sound of two footsteps walking. Mm. And that's well, a good friend of mine, Glenn, actually told me that and it always stuck st- stuck with me. So whenever those guys are saying, okay, I'm going to go into the bush looking for a Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yowie, Almasty, whatever you want to call it, mm. you got to go in with a different sort of mindset <laughs> of what these guys are going into. You, you can't. But this, it actually comes down to, I was, for a long time, I was in what was called the Aper Camp. Mm. This was a unknown spe- species of ape, mm. like a relative of humans, but... After a good few years now, looking into it, I believe that it's other. I don't know what it is, yeah. but it's not related to humans. Mm. And that's as much as I know. Now, I've been in the bush. My really good friend, Glenn, who has literally seen these things very close up as a biologist, mm. who will listen to this podcast, is probably shouting at me saying it's, it's an, a mammal in more <laughs> forthright terms. Yeah. And I love Glenn dearly, but we have to do, we always agree to disagree on this. He's convinced it's quite clearly a mammal. Mm. I'm quite clearly convinced that it's something else because this phenomenon is not just in Australia, it's in, it's in the US, it's in Russia, it's basically everywhere. Mm. It would have been seen by now. I mean, people always bring up this really inane sort of uh, comment, oh, we didn't know about the gorillas. But the problem is we now know about the gorillas. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you were saying that this is going to be an aper, uh, sorry, this is an unknown ape, we haven't even got really good high definition video of it. Yeah. And people say, oh no, it's just that clever, it knows how to hide. But that just opens up a whole Pandora's box of other questions. Well, how is it so intelligent and knows what a camera is and we're not aware of it? Mm. Why haven't we got good positive DNA? Why haven't we got good HD video? Mm. Why haven't we got a body? Why haven't yeah. we got scat? Mm. So while I did come from the upper side, I'm more into the other. I'm not saying I know what it is, mm-hmm. but I know I've got a fairly good idea. I know what it's not. Yeah. And that's where the 14 side it comes into. When we talked about cryptozoology, yeah. I kind of put that in more of the 14 side of things. And cryptozoology for me is always going to be more or less about the thylacine yeah. and animals that have known they existed, but are um, exploration in certain areas or maybe still hanging on in remote areas, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of a... I'm a bit unusual and people probably shout at me and I can hear people shouting at me already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I find it, it it is interesting that, you know, and the same thing applies in regards to, to, to the search for Bigfoot in North America is that there is a very um, well-established train of thought that it's that it is an of of an other dimension or it's it's more fortian than actual physical so i don't i don't mm. i don't see why that would be an issue i know like you say i think the vast majority of people who are searching for hominids believe they are a flesh and blood creature but that's not to say that there aren't substantial amounts of people who, who think there is more to this than than just uh, uh, yeah. you know an animal no, stomping true. about so yeah. i wouldn't i wouldn't pigeonhole yeah. hole as as being that far out there steve no no i get that but i mean uh, you've obviously seen over the past few years online there's a lot of egos on all types of these things and people are very passionate understandably so but um it would be good if people just uh, learn to take a step back and just dispassionately looked at the evidence and say well you know we'll keep it up in mind let's see where we go with the evidence no i didn't say that um i've seen physical evidence of something that was Highly unusual um, in the bush, which to this day I'm still sort of scratching my head with and saying, well, something clearly did that, and it's beyond the scope of what a human could have done. Yeah, it's in an area where a human wouldn't have went to, mm. and then along with that, there's massive footprints as well. So, and if if somebody wanted to hoax it, they probably could, 
Yep. But it would have been to an extraordinary amount of effort for the off chance that somebody may have come across it. So I look at things as a 14 does as being from a we rule out the obvious and we take things from a scientific bent as much as we can. Mm. But once you rule out all of that thing, you're left with still a conundrum at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's weird, but that's. That's Bigfoot, that's hominids, that's Yahweh's. That's what we're up against these days. Absolutely. And saying that, I've been very interested in the um, Patterson-Grimlin footage. I yeah. know there's a lot of uh, controversy about that, but I don't know. There's something about it that just makes me think it's real. I mean, I've seen the still footage of it, and even if it was a big guy in a suit, hmm. he's walking pretty He's walking pretty fast across that riverbed. Yeah. Now... You or I wearing a big suit walking fast across a riverbed and looking over your shoulder are going to struggle when we're wearing a big bulky suit. Mm. An animal wouldn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I mean, that, it's, it's one of those... Again, that just makes it strange. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And, it, and, and, and as with anything, I've seen as many people state that it's it's a complete hoax. that have, yeah. and, and as many say it's, it's completely genuine. I mean, for me personally, when I saw that footage as a young lad, it changed my yeah. life. I was just blown away. And here we are, you know, 52 years later. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we still... Oh, that long? Yeah, 60, <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke. Yes, <laughs> indeed. That was my very first yeah. experience. That's what... Yeah, you know, mine too. Mine too. <laughs> that's what sent me over the edge, Steve. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, I've always said, well, yeah. if, if it's a man in a suit, where's the suit? Show me the suit, mm-hmm. recreate it, and fine. You 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 prove us wrong. Nobody has ever done this. We've had numerous people over the years, and it's not just this particular incident. There are other famous, like the Sierra Sounds. People are saying, oh, yeah, they were hoaxed. Yeah. It, it yeah. takes two days on horseback to get to where they are. Um, and you're talking mm-hmm. about 1971. What You're telling me somebody's taken a whole you know, stadium rig out to the middle of nowhere and hooked it up? No, where, that's it. It, yeah. it, you know, and I know uh, Sanderson and um, uh, and some of the others like Peter Byrne were always of like mm. you referred to about hoaxing that these people would have to go into the middle of nowhere to hoax something on the off chance that someone else would turn up within such an, uh, a period of time to be able to still see oh, what the benefit? evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for what benefit? <laughs> I would like to meet somebody who has all this time on their hands and the inclination to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, exactly. That alone itself is, I mean, if you know, that's worthy of a 14 times article. You know, you come across a guy that actually goes all this effort to hoax a society, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it just seems to me, it's, it's kind of strange. But the whole thing, the whole thing's just wrapped up in weirdness. But it's like, I mean, particularly in, I think it's, Oh, what's that volcano in Northwest? I think it's near Washington State. Oh, oh, oh the name just escapes me. Is it Mount St. Helens? Yeah, that's one of those things. That always, that always struck me as being one of those places where it was, a, as Ford said, it was like an area of weirdness. You know, yeah. when strange things happen, this kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah it's. I don't think that's just um, particular to one area like there. We have definitely got very strange places in Australia as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, very much but so. But, yeah. It's, uh, there, yeah. there seems to be sort of um, window areas um, a, a, across the uh, the world where they just seem to be a, a magnet for for weird phenomena across a range of of forty and such situations. You know, poltergeists and mm. UFOs and cryptids. Mm-hmm. Certain areas just seem to have the whole shebang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. The poltergeist is an interesting one as well. Um, a friend of mine, Tony Healy. Mm. And his uh, friend as well, uh, Paul Cropper, they wrote a good book called Australian Poltergeist. Yeah. Is that the uh, um, hum- Humpty Doo yeah, case? Yeah, the Humpty Doo case. I'm giving it a shameless plug because um, Tony's a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, now if you get a chance to read that book too as well, um, that was highly unusual but highly informative too because it, it was clearly an intelligence behind what it was doing. Mm. You know, and it, it couldn't have been hoaxed because they were there and they seen things themselves. And they're going, that's very, very strange. But they were, t- uh, Tony, I was speaking to Tony, I think it was last year, and he was telling me about um, 
There was another case he was aware of. I think it might have been in India where they had, there was a poltergeist plaguing a family, mm. and they had to actually get. They brought a priest in, but by the chance the priest already had a previous experience of poltergeists, and instead of going down the whole demonic route, he went and says, "It's not a demon. It's nothing like that." There's no point in me doing an exorcism because all that's going to happen is that it's just going to go away in its own time. I've seen it before. Yeah. And he was right. So that was actually a priest then that says in these areas that I've seen this thing before. It's just here for a while and then it'll go. Yeah, I think well, it was weird. It is. I mean, um, I was I was very fortunate uh, a couple of months ago. I spoke to a guy called uh, Dr. Melvin Willin, who is the archivist yeah. for the Society of Psychical Research in the UK. And uh, he's just... Oh, really... for the Enfield case? I think yeah. I'm okay. Oh. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm... that was a really good interview. I enjoyed that. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, he, he was it was fascinating because that's probably the most well-documented poltergeist case in Europe, I would suggest. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. yet, regardless of the, the, the vast amount of evidence and witnesses... Um, it's it's still dismissed by people completely out of hand because of a couple of, of, of incidents where the girls were caught mucking about. But, you know, you've got police officers, journalists, people who weren't connected to the family who saw things, family members. Yeah. And and some of the, the, the physical effects, it's, it's well, as with, you know, both believers and skeptics sometimes tend to cling to one particular um, aspect of, a, of an incident and, and mm-hmm. ignore everything else and I find that frustrating on both sides of the argument because I think one of the things in Enfield that, that always makes me uh, sit up and notice is the fact that somebody ripped an iron fireplace out of a wall now yes. with the greatest yeah. respect you know a, a, a little lady or, or, or three kids aren't going to be have anywhere near well even a, even a fully grown man Steve you're going to struggle mm-hmm. to do anything like that yeah but, but it's not just a case of that. I mean, it's well, I totally understand that as well. I mean, sh- to lump all the weirdness in together. I mean, I really appreciate the Enfield case as well. Mm. But when we take it back to the Sasquatch for a sec, or mm. to the Yahweh and stuff, mm. poltergeist activity and Yahweh's tend to go together. Yeah. This is what a lot of people don't tend to want to actually uh, recognize. Now, um. I don't want to talk out of turn, mm. but uh, there's many cases in Australia where poltergeist activity has followed somebody who has seen uh, a Yahweh mm. and then become obsessed with proving its existence. Yeah. And then maybe this sort of sprite or whatever it is is latched on to that person, or maybe they're more in tune to the, to the Yahweh or whatever, and it's created poltergeist activity for them. I can think of about three or four people in Australia alone that that's happened to to a detrimental effect. But the that's interesting with the the Enfield case, that show of uh, extreme force. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, with with poltergeist with yeah, always with squatch and stuff like that. It's a show. It doesn't seem to be that they want to actually physically harm somebody. Mm. It wants to scare people. Yeah. That's, uh, this is just my opinion. It just, it just seems to want to put uh, a bit of fear into the person to get them to either back off or say, hey, I'm here. But it's not physically want to actually hurt somebody. Yeah. And I mean, for Yowies as well, it's been it's been quite interesting because the, the, the first time I, I kind of came across it properly was that there was um, an American show um, that was shown in the UK in the 90s called Sightings. Um, mm-hmm. And that was the first time I'd ever seen anything about the Yahweh. I think they come to Australia and they um, uh, they met up with Dean Harrison. Um, yeah, Dean and Dean. So uh, I've kind of been aware of, of, of the Yahweh since sort of the late 90s onwards. And, and the thing that's mm-hmm. always struck me about yeah. these uh, some of these witnesses is, is that there is a consistent fear um from these witnesses, whereas in comparison to, say, a lot of Bigfoot sightings, it's fleeting glimpses and things like that. But a lot of the cases in Australia, um, especially this year, there's been two very uh, public cases that have kind of gone mainstream where where both witnesses seem really, really shaken up emotionally um, about mm-hmm. what they've seen because they simply cannot comprehend what on earth happened to them. 
Yeah, that's true. Um, but isn't that just so bloody typical? It's just there all of a sudden in front of you and just shocks them. Yeah. I mean, this is an this is look, this is a being that's what between seven and eleven foot tall, mm. three hundred kilos muscular. It could easily rip a human apart limb by limb. Yeah. But yet, it never does that. Yeah. It's there almost to say back off. Mm. In fact, my good friend Glenn, um, he saw them at close quarters, and he had a, probably one of the best sightings that uh, a person could probably have. And I think Tony's actually put it in the updated book of the Australian Yahweh as well. Yeah. But he observed it for a good few minutes mm. at a range of between, I think it was 15 metres in the yeah. bush. And they were both just studying each other. And then uh, my friend Glenn backed off a little bit and then the Yahweh looked more concerning. And Glenn had said himself, and even when he talks about it today, that um, the her stand up on his, uh, on his body. Yeah. But for some reason, he decided, I'll, I'll go to follow this thing because it was it walked. Yeah. Whenever he made a few steps forward, it turned around and looked at him as if to say, no further. Don't come in. And he says it was just a chill went through him. Yeah. And he just had to there. get out of there. <laughs> and then the hour he just looked at him and says, no further. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so it would, I don't know about everybody else, but it would put the fear of God into me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, obviously coming yeah. from where we both come from, obviously you're from Belfast and I'm from I'm from Sheffield in Yorkshire. We're, we're very fortunate mm-hmm. where we live because we just don't, you know, the largest thing we might come across in a in a woods probably a deer. Um, yeah. Or, or, or you know, and the the largest carnivore mammal that we've got in the in in Britain and and Ireland is the ma- is the badger. So you know, yeah. you know, we don't yeah. have poisonous snakes. We don't have anything. We are we are. Um, very much <laughs> living in a in a very yeah, we're lucky. non-threatening bubble, aren't mm. we? <laughs> well, well, now I'm in Australia, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I've got to be very careful. I've got two young children as well, so whenever we get into the bush, I'm saying don't walk through the long grass. Yeah. Watch where you're going, very waterways and stuff, because we've got a lot of snakes and stuff here. Yeah. Everything in Australia wants to either kill you or make you really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but this well, is a, it's also the thing people say that um, you know well there's you know people don't believe in Yahweh and stuff now will say look spend five days in the bush go out there every day for five days mm. and tell me that you think everything's normal yeah because it's not and I reckon I don't know about the UK but if you go into the the bush in Australia and say spend five days by yourself in the bush you're going to have some interesting experiences I think. And it's just not just off uh, flipping. I've heard that many times of people saying that, yeah. I think the Aboriginals had it right. They looked at the Awe as being sort of a guardian of the forest, mm. that type of like a spirit. That's how they rationalised it. But uh, who knows at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, but I'm obviously. Always... Go on, sorry, Steve. No, no, I was just going to say the people are seeing something. Yeah. And you can't. We've got SAS soldiers seeing it, even. Bush Tucker Man, do you get Bush Tucker Man in the UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who the Bush yeah. Tucker Man is. Well, well, Les came out um, a couple of months ago saying, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Mm. And he said, <laughs> very few uh, have better um, experience in the bush than he does. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. true. I mean, well, it's, uh, and it's interesting, the parallels between the Aborigines and the, and the Native Americans and First Nations people, that they have, mm-hmm. that, they, they have the very similar conception of of what bigfoot is bigfoot is the protector of the forest and and connected with nature and and, and that is exactly the same kind of philosophy that the aborigines have about the hairy man yeah that's exactly right and that just makes it even more strange yeah yeah because they have we all have the same myth or the same folklorish tale right across the planet mm. but yet People say, oh, it's an unidentified ape. How is that possible? <laughs> How could it be that with the same sort of a creature is seen everywhere? Yet we haven't actually got a body. We haven't got scat. Mm. We haven't got decent uh, footage. Mm. Is it very good at hiding? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, uh, it just creates more questions the further you look into it. Yeah, it but is. that's the whole nature of Fortiana. <laughs> oh, very much so. It's uh, once you go down that rabbit hole, Steve. Good luck to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, and it's uh, one of those things. I mean, uh, the the other uh, 
creature out there in the Pacific that I've always been fascinated with. And I, I, I p perhaps think it is more ape-like than any of the others is obviously the Orang Peng deck because yeah. Yeah. that to me, I think um, once again, you've got, you know, experienced biologists and people who have uh, a great deal of experience, both physically and academically, who have had experiences out mm -hmm. there who are absolutely convinced they've seen a, an unknown ape. Um, mm -hmm. So that one, for me, I think out of all of these weird hominids around the world, I think that one is out of all of them probably the most likely an unknown species of ape, purely based on where it is, because it's it's quite a remarkable. Yeah, I was in Indonesia uh, two months ago, and I totally agree. Mm. I mean, there could be anything out there. Yeah, it's dense jungle, and even the locals can't penetrate it. So, yeah, yeah I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. The slightest. Yeah, well, you know, we we still we still keep stumbling across tribes who live in the middle of the Amazon that have never had any contact. So, you know, if we're only still, if, you know, and we're still finding uh, little yeah. little pockets of, of people now. It wouldn't surprise me in those vast regions, but you know, compared to yeah. you know sightings outside major cities, um, I know I spoke spoke to Peter Byrne the other week, and he was completely dismissive of anybody who'd seen anything on the on the eastern side of the Rockies. He just said, "Nah, it's all made up nonsense." <laughs> <laughs> which well, I found, that's which a viewer biologist. <laughs> yeah, but you know, and I, I, you know, but he's absolutely convinced it lives in north northwest, you know, Washington State, Oregon. Canada, yeah, absolutely, no problem. Everywhere else, he, he's <laughs> absolutely adamant, and it was really, it was really quite refreshing. Um, yeah, you know, and at the end of the day, he's ninety-three years old, and he's still getting out into the woods looking for the thing. And he's, he's, you know, he's obviously spent a lot of his life looking for the yeti and things like that. And it was just yeah. a very, a very refreshing take, to be honest. And and, and uh, I'd been warned Peter was very forthright, but I, I, I found him an absolute gent. He was lovely. I wish I could have spoke to him longer. Yeah, well, if he's in his 90s, he deserves to be as cantankerous as he needs to be. <laughs> I mean, his his autobiography is a story and a half because, mm. you know, obviously it originally born in Ireland and joined the RAF and then ended up running tea plantations in India um, and, mm. and then stumbled across the Yeti that way. I mean, it was just a really fascinating chat with him. Um, Bloody Irish. They're everywhere and they go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Leading us all astray, Steve. Leading us all astray. Good I know, day. I know. Well, that's what we do well. <laughs> <laughs> Specialise in it, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Never hurts, does it? No, of course not. Makes life more interesting, I say. Oh, very much so. I completely agree to that, sir. So, <laughs> um, the other key aspect of, of, of Australian mystery is, mysterious creatures is, is probably the most beloved ex alleged extinct animal on the world, I would say. Uh, which mm -hmm. is the thylacine. So, did you kind of get into that at the same time as 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 the Yowie Steve, or was that more um, of a, because that seems to have a far bigger range of sightings and experiences uh, in Australia than than the Yowie currently? The Yowie had my interest first, but mm -hmm. um, I more or less got uh, an interest in the thylacine through reading a few book, uh, books of a friend of mine who um, has a real deep passion for the thalassian. But um, then I got involved with the Australian Rare Fauna Research Association, mm. and it, they've existed for a good few years now, but they've got a wealth of data, of sightings that have been reported on the mainland in Australia for the past, I think, 30 years. Mm. Um, some of the sightings are extremely good, mm. and the other ones are like everything else, just flitting. I mean, so you got to take them. But they do actually hold a, or we do hold a plaster cast of a thalassine's uh, rear paw with mm. a hawk and stuff on it. And that was taken in Melbourne, and I think that was within the past twenty years, round about. I just can't really remember, just off the top of my head, mm. exactly when it was done, but. Yeah, there's um, even to this day, there's lots of sightings come from the mainland. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that uh, the thylacine does exist on the mainland to this day. Mm. In Tasmania, uh, I believe there's a few pockets definitely there, but um, they're very remote. I was in Tasmania in January, yep. and that was my first time there, doing a sort of a scope out, and 
even for such a small island, it's just breathtaking how remote places can be there. And there's ample places for that animal to exist and not be disturbed. But in saying that, it's still being observed there as well. So, mm. I mean, you have the Narding sighting in, I think it was 82. Yeah. Um, Hans Narding, he's seen it um, near Bobbena, I think it was, up in, uh, near the Arthur River anyway, up in the northwest Tasmania. Yeah. But that was a really good sighting, so he's seen it for maybe three, four minutes at a range of about 20 metres or something like that. But just using basic scientific um, methodology, you can say that that one animal there had parents. Yeah. And those animals had parents, and those animals had parents. Mm. You start to see that even if it was a very one-off creature, mm. that there, if you go back in time, there still had to be more of them coming through. But I've got little doubt that there's a... I have no physical evidence, but a, real, a great deal of hope that it's still there, it exists in pockets in uh, northwest t- Tasmania. Yeah. Was the Nordic yeah. sighting the guy who was a part ranger? Because I know uh, a, he wasn't was... just a yeah yeah he was he worked for the uh, Parks and Wildlife uh, Service but the um, he was actually a zoologist mm-hmm. believe it or not I think yeah. he was from Belgium or Holland yeah but um, for a, a witness you couldn't ask for anybody better he knew what he was looking at yeah. and my good friend Mike he went and, uh, and actually interviewed him about ten years ago I think he did yeah. and spoke to him and, <laughs> and very typically Hans Nording had absolutely zero interest in the thylacine yeah. <laughs> so he was—he was not—he's was not making enough for any reason, and he's, even the, uh, to his deathbed, he had absolutely no interest in the thousand. But he just recorded what he seen. Yeah. And he, yeah, so and he stuck to his gun. And said no, he definitely yeah. seen it there. Yeah. yeah so I mean, yeah, I remember. To me, that was a very good sign. Yeah, because I remember seeing an interview with him ooh, probably about twenty years ago, um, and, and and at the time I think they were saying it was the first. W- one that was actually being treated credibly because of who he was and and his, mm. his academic experience and 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 therefore uh the official line on it was maybe which was very interesting to see because <clears throat> they couldn't dismiss it out of hand because of who he was Be- you know he wasn't just a random backpacker or a tourist you know he was a guy who knew exactly what was supposed to be there and he came across something mm. that, that isn't supposed to be alive anymore. Yeah, it was interesting that the Tassie government took it so seriously and mm-hmm. decided to throw money at it. Mm-hmm. And it's not the last time they've done that. I know for a fact that they've done it at least twice in the 90s, where there's been very good sightings. I think they were on the northwest coast as well. And one was by a police officer who reported seeing one as well. Um, so, I mean, obviously the state government down in Tasmania are not dismissive of any sightings that are being reported to them by at least credible witnesses. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be a lot of hoaxers and stuff. I've seen some really daft hoaxes as well. And then I've seen a lot of um, people who've taken footage on the mainland of Australia mm. saying this is a thylacine, that's a thylacine, and it's quite clearly a, a canid. It's either a dog or a fox. Mm. It's a, that's got mange and it's got a wounded paw and it's hopping. Mm. You know what I mean, it's it look at first glance, dogs, thylacines look similar, but if you look at it, with a bit more of a bigger screen and know what you're looking at, you can tell the difference. Mm. We're actually very lucky that we actually have the footage of Benjamin and stuff in um, from 1933, yeah. because that gives us a really good idea of how the animal moved, and you can tell its spine was very straight. Mm. You know, it wasn't like um, a cat or a dog that could pivot. Mm. It moved the whole body as well. But um, Cole Bailey in uh, Tasmania is probably the the most learned amateur scientist and probably, um, yeah, the go-to guy for uh, any information he'd done on the thylacine in Tasmania. He actually witnessed the Tasmania in the 90s himself, but in a, in a very remote area in the Weld Valley in yeah. Tasmania. So I have little doubt that they're still existing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, and the thing about this is, I mean, the, the, there's been a wonderful show on uh, I think it's Discovery of the last couple of years called Extinct or Alive with a with uh, a gentleman called Forrest Gallant um, whose father was it his father or his grandfather was the first white uh, scientist to recognize and catalog the coelacanth 
when that reappeared mm-hmm. in the late 1930s. Um, so he's since then, you know, growing up, he's become a biologist and he's he's become obsessed with alleged extinct animals. Um, and he's he's found a couple. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think the cloud leopard was one, and he's also found a oh, beautiful animal. Oh, they yeah. are stunningly beautiful, aren't they? The coloration yeah. is just yeah. phenomenal. Um, and then he's also my found... father's favourite animal. Is it? <laughs> yeah, my dad loves them. <laughs> oh. Well, they're, they're they're wonderful creatures, aren't they? They're just so fascinating and uh, and, mm-hmm. and just beautiful the way they move and everything. Obviously, if you live. If you're an animal that lives near him, you probably don't have that. <laughs> don't have that high opinion. Yeah, of, you know, you're, you're on the menu, Steve. But um, um, but he also <laughs> found a giant tortoise that had apparently not been seen since 1900, and he's he's refound that. So even alone on that basis, I think when when we discover something that that we believe's gone or whatever, and we refind we we rediscover it, I think that always yeah. gives credence to to the hope that you know. Like, with the Tasmanian tiger. I mean, the other one that's been in the news recently is obviously the Japanese wolf, which is a very similar kind of yes, yes, yes. situation to the thylacine where they are, there are people in Japan who are absolutely convinced they are still there. Absolutely convinced. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's very interesting, the Japanese wolf. You know, it's one of those moments of synchronicity that uh, happens in Fortiana uh, as well. But yeah, I was looking into the Japanese wolf about a year ago. Mm. I find it a bit difficult that it escaped because Jap- uh, Japan is so popular. And uh, it's such a small island and so many people there that I think an apex predator like that would have been found by now. Mm. I could be wrong and I really hope I am. And oh, that's just my human arrogance saying that, um, that uh, yeah, well, I'm I trying to say that it's dead and it's not. Yeah, I think, like you said, I think that's a fairly good point because you know, Japan, I think the population is around 130 million, mm-hmm. um, which is obviously twice the population of the UK and, and what, three or four times larger than the population of Australia. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a massive amount of people for, like you say, quite a, a, a small pocket of, of, of islands, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It would be great if it was. I mean, oh. yeah, it would be... Another one of those uh, Lazarus species that we could hold up and say, look, there's hope for everything else. Oh, very true. Very true. I mean, mm. what what I've always been fascinated with, and I don't know what your opinion is since you moved out there, Steve, I think there are some aspects of Australian Fortiana that, that really deserve to be far well, you know, far better known around the world. Um, obviously, mm. the thylacine and the yowie are, uh, are the two key ones that are you know obviously the yaoi this year i i, I can't remember a, a, a time when it's been as mainstream it seems like the australian media has certainly grabbed hold of yaoi's i mean we've had some absolute nonsense i saw the story the other week that i don't know why they even published it, it was about a guy who thought he'd seen a yaoi and it turned out it was just a tree but it was like, <laughs> i was like right well why are we reporting this he's like oh yeah yeah we all thought it was a yaoi for 10 minutes and then we re- we walked up to it and it was a tree and I was like, well, why are we, <laughs> why are we talking about this? It's not, it's not even, yeah, man finds, man misidentifies tree story, um, <laughs> which I just thought was a bit peculiar. Um, but um, I think some of the other ones, I mean, one of the other um, fascinating cases that I've always been interested in, and is, it seems to be coming, I think there's a documentary on the way, is the Westall in- incident. Oh, in 66. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very interesting story. Yeah. Probably one of the best UFO sightings that um, I can actually worldwide that I can actually think of. I mean, you're talking about witnesses that not even in the dozens or in the hundreds were landed in a uh, a schoolyard mm. of a primary school. Yeah. Actually, I don't live too far away from it. I actually drive past it sometimes on my way to work. Mm. And today, uh, <laughs> you've got to love this street and sense of humour. Where the 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 landing of the UFO was alleged to have happened. There's now a kids play park and they've put UFOs, for, uh, play equipment for the, for the kids to play in. Oh, you got <laughs> you got to love this dream. You got to love this dream. <clears throat> well, why but, not? Um, yeah, there was a the documentary I remember watching maybe about no, a few years ago now that um, one of the guys done a lot of work on it. And after the whatever it was landed and took off, there was. Typically, military personnel came and uh, 
more or less threatened the teachers. And there was one teacher who was an amateur uh, photographer, and they took pictures of it. So obviously they confiscated the camera and took away the the film of the photographs that the the teacher actually took. But the interesting thing about me, um, the, the interesting thing about that story was that whenever that teacher was interviewed years later and sketched out the uniform, it wasn't actually an, uh, an Australian Air Force RAAF uniform. It was actually an American uniform. Mm. And so they were looking at it and uh, they realized that back then in 66, the U.S. Air Force had a base and, and just outside of Moorabbin, which is very close to Westall, mm. where it actually happened. So they wondered... Maybe the Americans knew something and they were just keeping it all very hush hush. Mm. But it's one of those things that um for me it's probably the, the number one best UFO public sighting. That's because it's sheer for the sheer amount of witnesses. And even today, if you go to Facebook and you can ask to join their page and they're still there and they're adamant. Yeah. And a friend of mine, Helen, I think her ex husband actually was a witness too. Yeah. And they're all adamant what they seen. It wasn't a weather balloon, it wasn't anything else, it was a craft that landed. And then yeah. took off through no propulsion that they could actually discern. Yeah, I mean, I've 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 seen a few people say, "Oh, yeah, they all saw a weather balloon," and then you're thinking, "Well, no." So, w- how did it retake off then? You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a great gust of wind that nobody noticed came and picked it up and took it away again. It's 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 phenomenal sometimes that, I, and I've said this a few times. Uh, um, sometimes the skeptical explanations are as are as as baffling if not more so than 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 the witnesses statements because <laughs> it, you're just like what yeah the, the skeptical uh, position requires a huge leap of faith leap mm. of faith to actually believe in mm. whereas the most logical thing that people are actually re- saying what they see mm. and whenever you're talking about a, a, like a witness statement if you say like one or two three people if ten people say the same thing happened yeah, you're gonna more or less believe it, but we're talking in the dozens and then getting into the hundreds, where all the the entire school come out and seen this thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. They're not under some sort of mass, you know, hypnosis or mass hysteria. Mm. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just one of those things that uh, the government just prefers to mock. You see it that happened in the news. Oh, these people see the UFO and then they make light of it and move on. But for the people that it happened to, it's very real, yeah. and they're still wondering. Yeah. What happened? You know, I mean, so you got to I feel a great deal of sympathy for them, and I think people, I think the yeah, Victorian state government need to be completely honest with them and say, look, this is what we know what happened in West in '66. Yeah. Because those people deserve to know anything mm. else that the government might be keeping back. Yeah, very true. I mean, it's mm. it's interesting as well for me because there are parallels with a with another case which is also um, I think about to to hit the mainstream, which was the Zimbabwe incident in the i think 1994 and it, it's very similar to the westall case where it's witnessed by dozens maybe over a hundred children and a couple of teachers mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah. and that once again completely dismissed dismissed out of hand and every everybody was hallucinated or or they all had mass hysteria um yeah but once again, 25 years on, they are adamant to what they saw. And no um, sceptical explanation will ever convince anybody who witnessed what happened there that they saw anything other than a, 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 an unidentified flying object of some description. That's exactly right. We're seeing it even more these days with uh, the USS Nimitz, all oh. the footage that's been released with that. Yeah. And I heard <laughs> the biggest laugh I had the past uh, week was that... Um, some U.S. military official said, oh, that footage wasn't supposed to be released. Well, I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. Pardon my French. Because there's no way known that they would have been able to get the data from a fighter aircraft without it being passed through several ranks of senior officials and be, for it to be okay to be released. That's it. That's just a lie. What they're doing is either one of two things. It's either they know what it is. Yep. And they want to put the fear of the Chinese and the Russians. Yeah. Or two, they have no idea what it is, and they want to figure out what it is from asking other people. Mm. That's, that's only two. Because the military don't, doesn't work like that. It, it's just not the way it happens. Yeah. I mean, there's no way known. It's not like you're sitting on an F-16 or an F-22 Raptor fighter, and then you just pop out your USB stick and say, oh, here's the footage I have <laughs> of all my high-tech radar and whatever 
sneaky biggie stuff that they have in the cockpit and say, oh, we'll just put it on YouTube. Here you go. Here's all the mainstream. That's not what happens. <laughs> and if that did happen, you bet your ass that somebody's been sacked. Yeah. And if that person's been sacked, he'd be in the mainstream media right now. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, I mean it, it is interesting because I, I know there's a, there's a big theory about all this, that it's like a drip drip because... I mean, yeah. as you as you refer to there, Steve, either of those explanations are, are quite terrifying. One is, is it a foreign power? And if so, how on earth mm. have they leapt a generation technologically? Because that's what it essentially is. But we're also mm. talking about something that happened 15 years ago, mm -hmm. which makes it even... So where are we, at, where are we now in regards to yeah. that? So you've got to... Con and, and if it isn't a foreign power, then that's even more terrifying because... My my philosophy of this is is they know what's happening, but they can't do anything about it, and that's the worrying thing because they can just come and go as they please, and n even for a country, especially America, because of the amount of money they spend on military technology and defence, they're powerless. But it's I know what you're saying, but mm. we can say that they're powerless. But if these things have conquered interstellar travel. Mm. A conquered travel between in solar systems stuff like that. We've got no chance anyway. But yet they've <laughs> displayed no set. <laughs> Their technology is way beyond what we are capable of. Yeah. But yet they've displayed no sense of aggression. Well, so why people say it's terrifying, terrifying. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it, people say they've been abducted and stuff like that. I honestly don't know. I, mean, I, mean, I, I believe that they believe that happened, and it could well have happened. I'm not going to denigrate anybody who says that that's happened to them mm. but for purely in a military defensive mindset mm. i mean these things could walk around any fighter that any nation on the planet has yeah. and it has yet to do that you know what i mean so and quite frankly uh, personally nine times out of ten you'll see them they're all based underwater gso some yeah. uh, unidentified submarine object that rises up and goes into the thing if you want to find a UFO, look under the sea. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's it's a, if look if it was us and we were um, say somehow we managed to have this technology and we found an Earth, we'd hide in the water too because yeah. humans and water don't mix. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just that, uh, just a little brain uh, thought of mine. Well, a friend, friend so. of, yeah. Well, a friend of mine said, well, we, strangely enough, um, was saying, well. Perhaps they are coming here and they're communicate, communicating with the most intelligent species on the planet. And that's why they're under the sea, because they're talking to the dolphins. <laughs> that's exactly you know, the thought had occurred to me as well. You know, I mean, because they, you don't see the dolphins messing up their entire environment. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you talk, you know you're talking about a, a, a species of creature that we sadly know very little. But we, we know their capacity for intelligence is incredible. I mean, the, you know, we've got I've forgotten the name of the dolphin, but the dolphin that was taught basically to communicate. Which was, yeah, yeah. which is mental. And then, you, I mean, we had that incident um, about four months ago where a beluga whale turned up in Norway that was basically yeah. acting like a trained dog um, that, mm -hmm. had, that had got a camera, a Russian, Russian camera on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, I don't know if you have a dog or a cat, but I mean, yeah. any animal owner will tell you that animals aren't stupid. <laughs> they, uh, to an extent, they know what's going on. At least in their immediate environment, you know what I mean. So, but uh, yeah, with um, I remember, I remember the I think the U.S. Navy did a lot of work with dolphins as well back yeah. in the fifties and sixties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tactical, tactical, but, uh, trying to train them and and use them as recon. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's not the first time humans have uh, used it as well. But uh, we digress. Um, <laughs> how did we end up here talking about dolphins? <laughs> USOs. <laughs> no, USOs, that's it. Yeah, well, there's actually, if you go on to uh, Reddit and stuff, I don't know whether uh, you guys have uh, used it quite a bit, but um, there's some fascinating stories that um, you find on Reddit, and whether they're true or not, I don't know, but mm. they have this sort of thing of of reality to them where people ask, what's the strangest thing you've seen on the, on the ocean? And people have seen some really strange things whenever they've been out sailing. And it's just, you know, one or two of them are USOs where the guy was in um, a sonar, for, uh, he was a sonar operator mm. 
for a large U.S. ship. Can't remember what it was now, but he was out on the deck having a smoke, and he seen something very anonymous under the ocean. It isn't in the Pacific somewhere. Yeah, and it just took off underneath the water and then took uh, literally rose out of the water and then disappeared. Yeah, he didn't say it shot up though. I don't remember him saying it shot up, but he just it disappeared. It's like it was so freaking. He wasn't the only one to see it. So, but then. We are 14, and the world is very strange, so Absolutely. it happens. Yeah, yeah, well, that's it, it doesn't happen. Very true. I think, and, and probably the, the most well-known USO incident that, that springs immediately to mind is, is uh, Shag Harbour in Canada. Yes, um, yes, I was actually reading about that the other day, yeah. Multiple witnesses. It was amazing, that. Multiple witnesses yeah. and military involvement. No denial of that, but yet, once again... Uh, I think I think they've tried to blame that on a meteor, but like everybody was saying, well, how's a meteor swimming about underwater? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's amazing how many people just accept the first explanation given to them. Yeah. Particularly from the government or the military. Yeah, because it should be the last people you actually <laughs> you believe. <laughs> oh, I remember. I can't remember what it was. I remember watching a program, Steve, where they had a military expert on who was just dismissing everything and they were talking i think it was a ufo researcher and he just went i cannot believe someone will will stand here and spew the amount of shit that the american government have told us about <laughs> things as if they've never lied to the public ever no, no. <laughs> and i was just like well this is the thing because it's it's almost as if some, it, they become it becomes like a belief um yes like a quasi-religious response to it that oh well the government have said this it must be it must be that and you just think really <laughs> how many times have we how many times have we literally seen it where the government says no 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 then 30 years later they said oh actually but did look into this <laughs> and here's the here's the past 30 years of documents we've looked into it. so they lied to us for 30 years well the, so how we, can you trust them exactly well, we've got this with ATIP. <laughs> You know what I mean? Well, they there you shook, go. They yeah. shook Blue Book down in 19, what, 69, 1970, and they'd never never investigated them at all, ever again. And then yeah. two years ago, it all comes out. Oh, actually, yeah, we've been giving Bigelow loads of money and other people, and, oh, we actually have been investigating these situations. Yeah, Randallstrom Forest. Oh. No, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah, right, you're telling me that something strange happened near Nuke Base and you didn't look into it? Yeah. If you didn't look into it, I want to know why you didn't look into it. Mm. <laughs> Whichever way, it's a, it's a matter of national security. That's exactly right, and that's what we pay the government taxes for. Allegedly, look after. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. Well, look at black black budgets or black budgets. You yeah. know what I mean? So, who knows what the tech that the people have that we would never see? You know what I mean? So, you kind of the biggest laugh I had was this uh, so called uh, raid on. Area 51. <laughs> that was the, the, the poor guy. Like I, I know that he put it out there as a joke and mm. just sort of snowballed out of all control. But yeah. could you like, could you imagine having like a hundred thousand people or whatever it was trying to storm Area 51? Oh. The US military would have went crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm, they would have I'm, taken I'm, everything out and then arrested everybody. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah. I'm, storming a <laughs> storming a military base is probably. One of the last things, even even in my daft life, Steve, <laughs> that even I would consider a, a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, you are going to get shot. <laughs> yeah, no matter how many shandies I've had, um, um, having once accidentally ended up in a Royal Navy base after a night out, um, I can... <laughs> and luckily getting away, uh, you know, because <clears throat> there's nothing better than after a night out in Pont Portsmouth deciding to commandeer a, an, an abandoned rowing boat. <laughs> <laughs> and then sort of That's where the Marines are too, you got to watch. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. Worryingly drifting inside a base that we had to climb over a fence to get back out of. <laughs> oh dear, how we got away with that, I'll never know. So apologies to the Royal Navy, if, if you were wondering <laughs> who accidentally... Never apologise to the Royal Navy, they don't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the other, the other, I think the only other real UFO incident from Australia, I remember, and, and you might know more about this than me, because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit sketchy on the details, was that there seemed to be a series of lights appearing over the sea between Australia and New Zealand um, between the late 70s, early 80s, and I think they sent a television crew up, um, and they actually captured it on film. Oh, 
Oh, that just, to be honest with you, that rings a very vague bell. I don't actually know it off the top of my heart. But the, the other big uh, UFO case that we have in Australia was the Frederick Valentich mm. case. Yes. That was between, uh, he took off from Moorabbin Airport, which is just a bit south from where I am at the minute, to, I think he was going to King Island or maybe northern Tasmania. But um, he actually radioed in and said that um, he was in contact with a metallic craft. And it's one of those things that they actually have, we actually today have audio yes. of his last communication as well. We can hear very strange metallic clanging sound. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the, so, and... Just recently, I've actually noticed that somebody had a uh, photograph taken on the same day. Yes. That uh, shows something just off the coast as well, which like uh, it's a bit blurry, but it looks like there's obviously a metallic craft of some description there. Yeah. But the whole <clears throat> the whole southern seaboard of the Australian continent is a very strange place. Yeah, I remember. There's I'm, been plenty of sightings. Yeah, I I saw <clears> an <throat> interview. That's all right. I saw an interview with um, the the radio operator that spoke to Valentin. Mm. Uh, on the day yeah um and he is clearly still very emotionally challenged by that mm. event because which even even regardless if you take a, take away the the potential of some weird phenomenon there steve you are essentially yeah. speaking to someone who disappears completely mm -hmm. so regardless of the fact that we've got the additional audio and the metallic noises and things like that that must be extremely traumatic for, for anyone, obviously, regardless, because you've essentially been communicating with someone who's in, in a great deal of distress, and then you just lose mm -hmm. contact, and to this day, you've no idea what happened to that person, regardless. That's exactly right. But the the state government took it very seriously as well, because mm. there was a huge um, operation that uh, was mounted straight away once it happened, Yeah, which makes you sort of wonder... They were all on edge about something anyway, you know, yes. obviously the military wanted to know something and they, they didn't hesitate in trying to find something, but there was not, not one thing was found. Mm. It was gone, yeah. which is sad. I think his parents, well, I'm not sure his parents are still alive, but oh, uh, just think about his parents at that time, you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's just so sad. Yeah. They, don't, they just don't have any sort of closure. Yeah. His dad, I remember and, seeing his dad interviewed a couple of times. Um, I mean, I think mm. he's, I think his father passed away. Um, recently, well, it might be in the last decade or so. I know it's, it's probably, yeah, but his brother's still alive. Um, yeah, and um, I know there's a there's a there's a uh, an author and a podcaster in America called Micah Hanks, uh, who is mm. who has built up uh, a really good relationship with uh, Freddie's uh, partner at the time. Um, yeah. And, she is adamant something strange went on because obviously at the time um, the famous uh, I mean I mean he's famous but he's quite an objectionable man uh, Philip Class obviously said oh mm. yeah drug runner mm. yeah he was he was dealing drugs <laughs> and I just thought what I mean how mm, I no mean, definitely I not mean, even on a even on a on a on a personal basis Steve that's a horrific accusation with no evidence that's lies too yeah. Um, no, there's just absolutely no way. No, that's just lies. I mean, the other the other one that always made me laugh was he was flying upside down. Now I know enough about that case to know that the plane he was in, if it was flying upside down for thirty seconds, the engine cuts out. <laughs> yeah. So, so once again, from so, that, you would see something fizzle. Um, he, he, I believe that he always had a bit of string or something hanging from the roof too. So you you'd instantly see that. You know what I mean? Gravity would. As a, a physical visual ID mm -hmm. of where the ground was, yeah, you would see that was pointed down or not. So I just don't, I don't buy that. Yeah, and I mean, and I really don't buy that he was a drug uh, runner. No, not at all. I think that's a horrific thing to accuse anybody of, especially. Oh, it's you know, terrible. You know, he no, he didn't knock about with dodgy people. He was just a normal guy who enjoyed going fine. And the other he was thing, a kid. That, yeah, the other thing yeah. that, that frustrates me about this is they say, oh, well, he was quite an inexperienced flyer. Well, I think he got over 110 no. air hours, which, you know, is is far. There are fighter pilots who go up with less experience than that. Um, so I mean, yeah. what what is an inexperienced pilot? For me, if you've flown over 100 hours, unless you're a commercial pilot or you're you're a member of the military, that's for a, for an average person, that's a hell of an amount of of time for somebody so young as well. 
Yeah. And if it was a disassembled crash, debris would have been found. Mm. The amount of uh, effort was put into the search. There'd be some flaws you know what I mean? bobbing would... about somewhere, wouldn't they? Definitely. I mean, that triangle from the Cape all way right down, um, the Bass Strait in between sort of Melbourne and Launceston, mm. um, it's turbulent. I mean, it just doesn't sink without a trace. It throws everything up. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. And it's, it's actually pretty shallow in there too. It's not exactly deep. Mm. So they would have found something. But no, it's yeah, it's very very strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I mean, there's a uh, a wonderful other mysterious thing where I think it was about three guys who went boating, um, and mm. then I think three days later their boat was found abandoned, completely. Um, and when they found it, there was like a coffee cup on the side, and and that and that that was explained as one of them fell in the water, somebody went to get him, he fell in the water, and then the other guy got knocked over by the boom. And he fell in the water, and the boat just sailed off and left him, and they died. I put that on the same level of belief as Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the cameras broke down at the same time, and the guards. And the man with the the guards were asleep. He took himself off suicide watch. <laughs> yeah, I'm not buying it. You know what I mean? And that half a billion that Epstein had all of a sudden within the trust fund, and nobody knows who was the beneficiary. There's a lot of things lined up there. Oh. What was it M said out of uh, James Bond? You know, first is happenstance, second is coincidence, three times is enemy action. Yes. And in Epstein's case, there was about ten things lined up. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was a lot of dominoes about to fall there. <laughs> I remember I remember when uh, when it when he was arrested, I was like, oh, because he's I, dead. I, yeah, I know enough about Epstein to know that uh, it would be far better yeah. if he passed away. Um, yeah, <laughs> and then the first the first time he he allegedly attempted to kill himself, uh, and some people going, oh yeah, brilliant, <laughs> dirty pedo, and I was like, whoa, whoa, hang on, I'm telling you now, we we don't need him to die because no. he knows. No, 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 no. The first time he tried to kill himself, that was an extreme red flag because he was such an arrogant bastard. Yeah, that he's the type of guy that sit there and would wait it out. Yeah, and he's so I think even the young Turks pointed that out and says he's not the type of guy that kill himself. He's the guy that type type of guy to wait it out yeah and he got away with it he's got these he's, um, yeah because he got that, that yeah there's just plenty bargain where he got 14 months house arrest where he essentially was just allowed not to leave his house but he could just carry on doing <laughs> what he was doing and i was just like what i mean he lives in a mansion yeah. for god's sake that's not house arrest <laughs> yeah if you were a spook and you wanted somebody in your pocket yeah and they had the dirt on epstein mm -hmm. to somebody all they have to do is say, we'll kill Epstein, but you're in our pocket now. Mm -hmm. So put your, uh, the way I look at it, just my conspiracy sort of mind, I would look at Russian, uh, Russian, German, UK, or US intelligence services. Mm -hmm. They're the people who know something about how he died. Yeah. Because they're protecting somebody else. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a very famous incident that happened in, in the UK, I think 1978. Um, where a Bulgarian diplomat was killed in the middle of rush hour in London. I think he was walking on one of the bridges. I can't remember which bridge he was on. And it was oh, a, with the, the and it was umbrella? complete mystery. Yeah, and it was complete mystery. And then I think it came out ooh, 10, 15 years ago. He was killed by the Bulgarian Secret Service with a poison-tipped umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> And you're like, okay, so so we just, yeah, no, I'm not not having any. Epstein did not go on of his own volition. I'm I'm completely in agreement there, Steve. Yeah, he was too arrogant. He was an arrogant man, very arrogant man. There's well, no way arrogant men uh, kill themselves. Well, exactly. Like I say, you know, and, and a very powerful and influential man as well. So you know, he had. Yeah, he had a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of friends. In I'm actually surprised that there's been, yeah, a man like that always has an insurance policy. So I'd be surprised that there's no video comes out somewhere. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. much so. There'll be uh, there'll be uh, some grubby secret appear and uh, yeah. and we'll we'll see what goes. But uh, yeah, as soon as soon as he got arrested, I was like, right, let's let's see how long he got. <laughs> he lasts. <laughs> I said the same thing. I just as soon as he was arrested, I thought, no, nah, he's dead. <laughs> he's not going to make it. <laughs> oh, the world has turned us into very cynical men, Steve. <laughs> Ah, we always were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, in regards to, to to yourself, what are you currently involved in 
out there, Steve? Are you are you uh, out? Because you've mentioned that you've, you've been doing some scouting in Tasmania earlier this year. So what, yes, what, go. what are you going to be planning to do, and where where do your fortean feelings dragging you towards next? My passion now is the thalassing, and I really want to spend more time in Tasmania. Um, I'm looking at late next year. I'm actually just reading it down to maybe late next year or the year after, so it'll be 2022. I'm going to spend a good two months in the Arthur River region, up in northwest Tasmania. Mm. But uh, I'm not going with the mindset going, I'm going to find a thousand. All I want to do is go and enjoy the area mm. and just have a look. Right? Because... Even with the thalassine, it could be considered to be a 14 thing because it just plays with you. That um, It's just flitting sights here, flitting sights there. But, you know, sometimes you just got to smell the roses and take yourself out into the bush and just enjoy life. So that's entirely what I'm going to do with regards to that wonderful animal. Yeah. But um, even if I find evidence of it, I wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's... I mean, I'm... I'm... I've got the impression that there are a couple of people who've who've come across something, um, and are very um, secretive because I think, as with anything like this, if it's announced, we know human nature is that some idiot's just going to go there and try and bag one, mm. regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that would be a damn I've seen shame. some very convinc I've seen some very convincing photographs too. Mm. That's all I'm gonna say. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know it's one of those little tantalizing things and I don't mean to be, but um I'm ninety nine percent sure they still exist. Yeah. But um I think they're very hard to find because they're in very remote areas. So mm. But Ooh. good luck to them. You know yeah. what I mean? This is an animal that's uh, survived all the worst humans could throw at it. Yes. And surviving where it, where it can and mm. let it be. Yeah. <laughs> All we wanted is it's our human nature just to just to know and mm. the romantic side of me just wants to see it just once in the bush yeah. and think that'll you know, that'll make me happy. I'll let let it be. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah. a lot of people like that. I think the last weird subject I'll touch on is um, is something that that connects Australia with with the UK and. America, um, but mm-hmm. the UK and Australia, it's, it's far more perplexing, and that's mysterious big cats, because you guys don't oh have ABC a, yeah, yeah you guys don't have a record of them, and we certainly don't what hear. well the, <laughs> that's what I mean so I'm 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 not so much in the UK because obviously we've got very Beast of Exmoor, Beast of Bodmin and, and certain things. Uh, but obviously there was the wonderful story in France uh, yesterday where a pet Yeah, just pan- recently with the... Pet Panther got yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Which, which question... First we... Of... Yeah. Why so did... we've got a huge yeah. history of big cats in Australia. Yeah. So what what what's your feelings on that phenomenon, Steve, in regards to, to them being out there? Because... Australia, similarly to Florida, it seems to be very welcome to invasive species. Yeah. They are definitely in Australia, and they're definitely in Victoria. Mm. And New South Wales, where Sydney's the capital of New South Wales, even the state government said there's more than likely a breeding population of big cats in the Blue Mountains. Yeah. So that's the state government actually recognising they're there. Here in Victoria, we've had SCAT test the positive for Puma. I think mm. it was, yeah, it was definitely Puma. Um, we've had big cats spotted quite regularly on all over Victoria, basically all over Victoria. They exist, most certainly. What I think has happened is that back in... There's always a story here that um, World War II, the Americans uh, pet had cougars. Pumas as pets, yeah. <laughs> pet cougars. That doesn't wash. The simple reason is they would have died off by now. And even if they had like 10 or whatever, they would have inbred and died or whatever. Mm. With the advent of Australia becoming more populated, they've had more opportunity. We've had massive ports here and you can't search everything. So people have come in. Do you want to buy a a Puma? That's fine. And even today, I mean, you know about the dark web. You can buy anything in the dark web. And I've seen it myself. You can buy 
animals on the dark web as well. If you've got enough money, you can get it. Yeah. Now, a friend of mine's uh, wife, she was up in the country and came up to a gate late at night, and there was a mountain lion. Puma came right up there with a collar on. So, <laughs> so this is an animal that doesn't belong anywhere near Australia, but it came up there with a collar on before running off. So I think a lot of the case, a lot of the times, there's been people brought in these bloody pets. And because a lot of people in Australia can live in the bush yes. and live remote and far away, mm. you can actually, um, they get too busy to feed, too costly to feed, they just dump them in the bush. And it's a smorgasbord for a big cat because it's so vast, there's so much forest and there's so much to eat. Mm. They're just going to survive. They're going to thrive. They're not going to survive. They're going to thrive out there. Mm. And we've got plenty of plaster casts, plenty of scant. And a good friend of mine, Helen, and she's got audio and I've heard it. And she's in a car and there's an almighty roar of this big black cat right beside the car. Oh. And yet the state government tries to tell us that it's actually a feral. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you heard this audio, you're going, that must be one hell of a size of a feral cat. Because <laughs> it's like, roar! <laughs> Well, and she's seen it a few. She's seen them a few times now. So yes, we have a vast population of big cats in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's it. For me, it's it's really interesting because, um, I I don't understand why some people just um, deny it in the states because we you know they they've got well established pockets of, of of mountain lions and cougars and and you know jaguars crossing over from the Mexican peninsula and coming into the into the southern states. Um, yeah, but that once again, they're not supposed to exist where people are seeing them, and I, I and I, I that for me, I, I don't really understand because there's far more opportunity and potential, and there have been random big cats turn up in places where they're not supposed to be under any circumstances in the states, um, and like you say, in Australia, there are some localities that are so remote you can essentially do whatever you want, and nobody will oh, yeah, know. Totally. Nobody will know. But we also have, because Australia being beyond the Wallace line, there shouldn't really be anything apart from marsupials and the occasional mammal here, but definitely nothing of the cat sort of uh, size. Um, but with the cats and stuff like that, um, it's the state government, we know through the ARFRA, the Australian Rare Fauna Research Association, have been told off the record that the state government knows they exist. But it's a... It's a hot potato because if you, the state government come out and say, yes, there's breeding populations of large cats out in the bush, it's a knock-on effect of saying, well, hunters will now want higher powered weapons. Yep. The state government is then responsible for the parks and they've got to put signs up saying, oh, there's big cats here, watch out, yada, yada, yada. Yep. And it's just a huge cost nightmare and it's far easier for the state government to deny and say, well, no, they don't exist. Well, no, that's just a once-off or whatever. Deny, deny, deny. It doesn't cost them anything. Yep. But in saying that, if we know of at least one incident where there was a disappearance of a, a person who was on the way to a bush party, yep. and he didn't turn up to the bush party, and the, our association was told off the record that the state government was and the police said it had all the hallmarks of a large cat attack. Yeah. It was a big cat attack. Was left, so there. It's quite clearly that they they know they're there, mm. they know that they're a danger, but it's such a minimal risk to them. It's easy for them to, to, to deny. Yeah, yeah. All right. Brilliant, fascinating subject. So, Steve, mm. um, I know you've got a busy evening ahead of you, so I'll let you go. So, where can everybody catch up with your work and find out what you're involved in on online? Uh, try the uh, for Yowie uh, information. Try the Victorian Yowie Field Researchers Association. Mm -hmm. um, but my main interest would be the Australian Rare Fauna Research Association dot org. Mm -hmm. And for anybody in Victoria, please join. We're looking for fresh blood. Yep. Instead of sitting behind a computer, come and join. Yep. We'll give you the details. You can go and interview. You can go out and chase up the leads like uh, Fox and uh, Scully. From uh, the X Files, you can <laughs> check it out. Um, on Facebook, my page is the uh, Weird Planet Oddities, High Strangeness, and Life Less Ordinary. That's on Facebook. Or myself, just Steve Crawford. Um, you'll know it's me because of the big face of a monkey is my profile. <laughs> but um, apart from that, I'm going to give a few plugs to a couple of good friends of mine. Absolutely. 
Yeah, uh, Mike Williams, Rebecca Lang, uh, if anybody gets a hold of their books, read them. They're fantastic and they're absolutely really good friends of mine, wonderful people. Mm -hmm. um, Tony Healy and Paul Cropper read their books on Australian Yowie and Australian Poltergeist. And I can't think of anything else just at the minute, but I um, just want to give a thanks to Meryl. Uh, <coughs> Meryl from uh, Australian Rare Fauna Research Association for being my little angel on my shoulder <laughs> and um, a good thanks to everybody else who I know um, I'm pleased that you brought me on, the, on to your podcast as well yeah. so thank you Paul Hey my pleasure and I, um, I mean I've, I've read Tony's book about Yowies it's, it's a fascinating and extensive mm -hmm. look in the history because it, it goes back near enough 200 years of reports which I Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the one of the first books I bought on on the Yowie phenomenon. So it's it's something I just find incredibly fascinating. And, and Tony's a, yeah. a, a fabulous author, so I, I highly recommend. That. And uh, hopefully one day get the chance to have a chat with him as well, because I'd really like to have a chat with him about the uh, the Humpty Doo case. Because poltergeists are my uh, my. Uh, my oh, passion. I'll, I'll pass on the message. Oh, that's very kind of you, Steve. So listen, thank you yeah. so much for for taking some time out of your evening. Um, I know we're both looking forward to the football that's about to come on. So <laughs> <laughs> probably for different reasons. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I will wish you all the no, very thanks best. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I'll speak to you online again. So take care. Thanks for your time today, okay. Steve. Thanks a lot, Mike. Take care.